to Tortoise um, in person. Lots of you, great to see you. And online, um, I think we've got quite a few people uh, dialing in as well. Um, my name's Giles Wittell, I'm an editor here. And as the title suggests, the title is here on the screen, we have a theory, all right? And the theory rests, I decided earlier, on a fact, a likelihood, and a hunch. The fact is that within the Conservative Party, the ruling party of the United Kingdom, uh, there are people on manoeuvres on climate, and we'll come to that in a bit, talk about that more. The likelihood is that the net zero policies that we have in the UK, though ambitious by global standards, won't get us there. You can, we can argue about that as well. And, and the hunch is that in the end, people won't care enough to force the action required to get there, to net zero. And this leads to the theory, uh, which is, I submit, the elephant in the room, or at least a, a baby elephant growing uh, fast, which is that we're bored of climate change. And um, we here, I'm defining very broadly, not, not us lot, not even if we think about we as everyone taking part in this conversation, including online. But, um, well, I asked myself, what, what do we mean by we? And I thought perhaps a, a, a good answer to that question is the world's electorates. The electorates that have given us a grand total of one Green MP in this country, the electorate that was supposed to turn the last but one Australian general election into a climate election and just didn't, people weren't bothered. The electorate that has given Joe Biden no clear congressional majority so that Joe Manchin goes with his own coal miners instead of uh, his party's desire for a big uh, climate action policy package. And back here, the electorate that, depending on which poll you look at, has between 40 and 60 percent of this country wanting a vote, a referendum on those net zero policies. Anyway, um, let's get stuck in. We've got some great guests here in the room and online, and I will introduce them as we, as we come to them. But as we always say in a thinking, this is about you, uh, we really want to hear what you have to say, so pitch in. I'm going to try and do that thing where I um, uh, keep an eye on the chat um, while simultaneously um, seeing what you guys want to say. And, the, and please, the best, thing, the best thing of all is just raise your hand. Um, I can't see you if you raise your hand online, so please uh, use the chat, and then I think my assistants will, um, will alert me to, to what's being said there, and we'll try and bring you in uh, online as well. Um, there's no need to ask a question. In fact, we generally prefer it if you just say what's on your mind rather than asking a question, so it doesn't oblige anyone to answer. Um, and we, we value your opinion as it is, and we hope that we will pull all the threads together and uh, have learned a bit by the end of the hour. One other thing is that yellow stripe will get longer and longer. When it gets to the right-hand side of the screen, the hour is up, and it seems to accelerate as it goes across. <laughs> so uh, do please, th th there's, it's not like Q&A comes at the end. Q&A starts right now. So if anyone has something right on their mind right now, you can say it, you can interrupt the whole process. Um, but, insofar as I'm still in charge of the process, oh, yes, um, and I was supposed to uh, repeat what Mark said at the top, that we're going to have a slow down two minutes at the top of the hour. Looking forward to that. Um, let me come first to Sam Hall uh, on the extreme left there, which is not entirely appropriate because he is director of the Conservative Environment Network, um, uh, which is centre-right uh, caucus, to use the American phrase, of uh, Conservative MPs and others. Um, Sam, I, I warned you that I was going to do this, so l let's start focused in on the politics. Um, there, there are groups of Conservative MPs to your right who um, are articulating this, this case that w w there should be a, a vote on uh, the government's net zero policies. Admittedly, the, the, the most full-throated uh, um, proponent of that is Nigel Farage, who's not in your party at all. But the net zero uh, scrutiny group is. Um, 
and Net Zero Watch includes a lot of uh, Conservative MPs on the right of the party. Are they serious in a desire to completely recalibrate um, government climate policy, or do they just want a fight? Um, well, firstly, thank you for, for having me on. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, to answer your question, I mean, I think it's important to go back to the fact that in 2019, every single Conservative MP stood on a clear manifesto commitment to achieve net zero by 2050. It was very prominent in the manifesto. I think it was on in the first few pages. It was in the top six election uh, guarantees that the Prime Minister made with his personal signature beneath it. Um, and I think, you know, the democratic uh, responsibility that Conservative MPs have, therefore, is to, is to follow through on that uh, and to support policies to deliver it. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely right that there has been in the last few months a few uh, Conservative MPs who've been more vocal uh, in, in opposition to some of the government's net zero uh, policies. And I think, you know, it is absolutely right that we scrutinise these policies for affordability, for fairness. That will make good climate policy ultimately if we make sure that those factors are mainstream throughout everything that we do. And clearly there are some challenges in terms of upfront investment to deliver this transition. Um, but I think you know, the vast majority of Conservative MPs that, that we uh, see and speak to uh, are still in support of the, the target and also see a lot of economic opportunities as well. And the links to the government's levelling up agenda and the chance to bring industries back to, to the red wall. Uh, now, this isn't directly related to our exam question, but since we're here in the sort of political core of the issue, let's admit that the Prime Minister is in a pickle, not as serious a pickle as he was perhaps 10 days, two weeks ago. But do you think there is a uh, serious chance that in reassembling his support within the party, he tacks to the right on this and um, invites uh, Steve Baker and others in and says, you know what, we may not actually have a vote, vote but I'm thinking hard about it. I don't think he will, no, for the primary reason that I don't think that's where the majority of the, the party is. Um, so the, the caucus that we support uh, at the Conservative Environment Network is over 120 MPs. Um, I think about 19 MPs signed uh, the letter in the Telegraph at the start of the year um, calling for uh, the government to look again at some of the net zero policies around the cost of living. So I think, you know, just on a mathematical level, it would not be a, a, wise, a wise decision to make. But I also think if you look at what we've seen so far in response to the energy bill crisis, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor as well have correctly identified that the cause of this is uh, an international gas crisis, um, rising demand in, in Asia and constricted supply from Russia that's pushed up gas and there's not really much that the government can do about that and that's why Rishi Sunak's package uh, of support was around helping people with with their energy bills rather than you know massive uh, changes to to energy policy in terms of stripping back net zero and actually the one of the, the most substantive thing the government's done energy policy in the last couple of weeks has been to make the to increase the frequency with which we hold renewable energy auctions from every two years to one year so the government I think is is doubling down and accelerating on clean energy so you know, I take a lot of uh, you know courage from that, uh, encouragement from that, in terms of how the prime minister is looking to respond to it. And I think just for, sorry, final point: looking ahead to 2024 and how the Conservatives are going to hold on to the seats in the red wall. Um, you know, we've already seen in the last uh, couple of years, off the back of the government's net zero targets, lots of companies committing to build new factories and lots of other infrastructure off the back of that target. I think it would be madness to row back on that target now, and you know, the loss of investment you get in the red wall will be very significant. OK, but as I understand it, the green levy, £158 a year, stays as part of government policy. Let me, and you may have something to say about that, but uh, if, if we can, first, can we go to Baroness McIntosh, Anne McIntosh, who has joined us online, formerly the, hello, formerly, I should be looking straight ahead, there we go. Uh, it's just a long way away and I have to put my glasses on. I'm going to have to become like a sort of Robert Peston. But, but anyway, um, uh, formerly MP for the Vale of York. Now, uh, Baroness McIntosh, you've uh, written and spoken about the question of who pays for these net zero policies. Um, uh, who do you think in the end will, given that the green levy remains part of policy, and, and who do you think should? Well, from where I sit and where I've lived and represented uh, 
for the vast majority of my life has been in deeply rural areas. And I think the fear is that it's rural areas that are going to pay. If you look at um, the current crisis, I think we're partly in it because we haven't stored uh, enough energy in this country. I think we only store a third of what, for example, Germany uh, stores. So that's not a good start. Many of the energy costs currently uh, in rural areas are not covered by the price cap. So that is uh, not a good start. If you look at the alternatives, whether it's onshore or offshore wind farms bringing uh, a lot of the new renewable energy in, many people don't realise that you have to have these ghastly overhead pylons transporting them, particularly in the north. I think most of the wires are undergrounded in the south. So I just have, I suppose, a vested interest in protecting rural areas, particularly in the north, to make sure that we have a good supply of energy. One of the reasons for not wanting to transmit energy by overhead power lines is you lose 30% of the energy created by overhead power lines. So um, there are alternative sources that we've not explored enough at the moment. I think nuclear, we've got a bill before us that we had a second reading on today about nuclear energy and how we're going to finance that going forward, particularly smaller, uh, more accessible nuclear reactors. I personally am opposed to fracking, but I would like to follow the example in Scandinavian countries, Germany and Austria, where they take much more energy uh, from waste. So you're actually dealing with two problems there. You're disposing with your household waste and you're feeding that energy back into the local community, which is the best way of doing it to give them cheaper hot water and electricity. So there are avenues that currently we are not exploring that I think we should do more of. And in terms of governance and um, democracy, uh, where do you stand on the idea of voting uh, a separate vote on net zero plans? Well, where we are in the democratic process is we, we are bound by the Climate Change Act. Um, it, it, I think it was under the Labour government, but, but that is now um, statutory law, it's in place. Uh, we spent hours uh, debating the Environment and Agriculture Acts, uh, which looked at, at many of these proposals. Um, I've, I think you could have an interesting result if you were to have a referendum in different parts of the country. Um, I, I do think rural dwellers feel very neglected and overlooked and feel that they don't have their say. So, so perhaps a referendum would be a good way forward, but we are bound by the legislation which is in place. Most of it uh, I agree with, some of it I have problems with, but you know, we, we start off with the Climate Change Act, the Environment Act and the Agriculture Act. Uh, w one of the talking points of the Net Zero Scrutiny Group is that current policies um, well, one of them is that is that the people who will pay for them haven't been properly consulted, but but the democratic process that has given us the Climate Act is a, a form of consultation. But the, another talking point is that these policies will make these people um, uh, poorer and colder. Do, do they have a point? I mean, broadly speaking, if we put the politics aside, the sort of the politicking aside, um, and and referring back to your former constituents and the, the people who you speak for, is there a point there that these, these policies are going to, the burden is going to fall on those who can least afford them and most need help? Well, I think one issue that we have to meet head on is I can think of no other sector whereby, uh, and you look at uh, utilities such as water, you look at Ofcom telecommunications, Nowhere else is the consumer asking, uh, being asked to pay up front for the next generation of infrastructure, uh, which is clearly the case through the green uh, levies. 20%, uh, I believe, of our energy bills before we've even turned on the electricity to boil a kettle or fire up your mobile phone is going to these green levies. That, that simply is not the case in any other sector. Um, so um, I, I think, for example, I think you need a certain amount of honesty. So when the energy bill, I think it was under the Labour Party, this uh, the Labour government, in, and I, I sat in uh, as an opposition MP in the 2000s, where for the first time it was said that this infrastructure cost will be met 
on the face of an energy bill for each household. I don't think Labour actually went out and said to people that we're going to whack your energy bills by another 20%. So I think we need to have a certain energy in the debate. I think we need to have also a more rigorous policy of testing what works and testing what doesn't work. We've got knee-jerk reactions of going out and asking people to invest in heat pumps, but we haven't said to them that they won't fire up your home to the 21 degrees or 20 degrees that people might feel comfortable sitting in at the moment. They only heat up your house to 16 degrees, so you're going to have to have another source of energy if, if you like sitting in 20 degrees. And, and, and all this thing about eating less meat uh, heating your home to uh, a lower rate seems to have complete disregard for those of us who, who, who live in much colder, uh, more isolated conditions in the north of England. And I, I think we need to have an honest debate in, in, this, in this regard. Thank you very much. I see that Margaret Taylor in the chat is calling a referendum an utterly outrageous idea. Margaret, I, I don't know if we can turn the camera on you as it were, but um, I'd love to hear why you think that is the case. Um, I tell you what, why don't we try to come back to you, Margaret, but first I'll come to Matt Winning. Matt has lots and lots of jobs. He is a senior, let me, let me get this right, research fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Resources at UCL. He's also the author of this book, Hot Mess, What on Earth Can We Do About Climate Change? And uh, sorry to land you in it, he's a stand-up comedian. Um, uh, Matt, um, just returning to the overarching question we brought of climate change, you have, a, you have a chapter here, I think it's called um, When Will the World End? Starts at page um, 89, yeah. um, referencing The Day After Tomorrow and other disaster movies. Yeah. How could we possibly be uh, bored by climate change? And what do you make of the, of, of the thesis? Well, so far the discussion, it, it's really hard to keep these two ideas in your head at the same time, because we're talking about policies to stop climate change while never giving any airtime to what, we, what will happen if we don't address climate change, which is people the poorest around the country will be worse off and maybe not colder, but they'll be flooded and they'll be often far too hot and they'll be, you know, Ill. again, it's very similar to COVID. I mean, there's so many similarities between COVID and climate change uh, in terms of it's about protecting the most vulnerable people in society who are going to be affected by this. But the time scale's such a lot, you know, it's such a long time that it's really... If we're getting bored of it, it's just because it's going to, I mean, it's going to continue for all of our lives, <laughs> you know, for the rest of every single person's life in this room or that's watching online, climate change is going to be an issue. And sure, you know, with COVID and other things like that, we might get to a stage where we're coping with it. And it might be the same for climate change. We might get to a stage where we feel like we're coping with it. But the idea that we can sort of discuss these policies or issues as if we're bored of something and it'll just fucking stop is a bizarre way to treat a subject that requires you, unfortunately, to have two things in your head at the same time, which is, if we do this, then this will happen, but if we don't do this, then, you know, the world is not going to continue on some sort of level footing. Uh, so, so you always have to keep in your mind the reasons why we are doing these policies at the same time as, you know, getting the policies right and trying to move in a, you know, and I think I, all everyone that's spoken so far, I completely agree. You know, we need this to be fair. We need to talk about uh, who the costs fall on. But often it's quite a mad, you know, I often hear people, some of the, the politicians that you, you talked about at the start, and they'll say, you know, we can't put, place this burden on future taxpayers, right? But we're talking about solving this in 30 years time. I am that taxpayer, and my son, who was born last year, you know, will become a taxpayer in 80. It's, 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 we're not talking about people that don't exist yet. We're talking about us, and we're talking about doing things now that sure are difficult for us now and that we have to pay for now in order to protect people in the future and to have the benefits accrue back to us because things will be much cheaper. 
risk because we'll be on a, you know, on a much, you know, we're going to be paying a lot less in healthcare costs, for instance, because we don't have cars polluting our roads, because we don't have other things like that. So it's really, tri it's really tricky, and it's, it's a very, you know, it's a big oversimplification to sort of say, you know, we're bored of climate change because it's not going to go away if we're just bored of it. Um, but would you concede that? Um uh, for the for the climate uh, movement to succeed, for uh, policies which are in law to be pursued to their sort of intended end, yep. you've got to bring bring people with you. Hundred percent. And, and and enthusiasm for those policies kind of up up and down. Up yeah. and down. Yeah, and I mean we had a sort of a, a big nadir uh, recently with COP26. It focused people's attention. It's very difficult to keep people's attention focused and on this for a long period of time. So we need to find other ways of talking about it, of keeping people interested, of building you know, cohesion amongst people. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I wrote a book about it. And it's a comedy book because, again, you need to start reaching out to other groups. You need to start trying to reach people in ways that they wouldn't normally engage with the subject. And, you know, I, I, I think it's sort of, you know, what I've tried to do is sort of try to educate people a little bit at the same time while actually, you know, not putting them off, not not making them bored, <laughs> essentially. Because if, you know, if people are bored, they may not engage or they may feel like there's other issues. I think what we've seen is that we had this massive peak of, you know, I think 40% of the British public said that climate change was the biggest issue in our country in November. <laughs> and in two months, it's dropped down to something like, 16% of people in the country, because people can focus on one worry, at a, you know, major worry at a time. And that was climate change, because we were focused on it. And then we had COVID come back and everybody's like, okay, I need to focus on this. And we see it even with politicians. Johnson's focused on one thing, trying to stop one thing. It's, it's difficult to, to, you know, when it does take up so much of our energy and our time, um, as you say, to, to, to kind of keep on it. Um, so how do we solve that? I think we need to find more ways of talking about it. We need to make it more part of everyday conversations in life. Um, and we do need to have you know, conversations about who, you know, what we do about climate change. But you always have to have in mind when you're talking about that, well, who's affected if we don't do that? Because that's the world. You, know, you have to live in a, a realistic. OK. I, I still would like to come to Margaret uh, Taylor if we can, and we're going to come to Rebecca Willis in a couple of minutes. Um, she's joining us from Lancaster. But first, I think Harry Wilkinson from Net Zero Watch has joined us and is very kindly raising his electronic hand. Harry, if we can come to you. Um, uh, I was kind of taking your name in vain earlier um, and, and putting words into your mouth, as it were. Um, uh, Matt has just made the point that since COP, do, do we still have Harry uh, with us? Yeah, no, I'm here. Okay, great. I just can't see you on the screen. This is awful. I can see myself instead. Um, uh, so uh, Matt was making the point that since COP, public enthusiasm for everything that was d uh, discussed there seems to have fallen off a bit of a cliff. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, I think uh, rising prices uh, will put pressure on net zero policies because when people are being really squeezed, I think they're going to rightly ask for the government's focus to be on getting energy prices down. Um, and I think it's it's been said a lot over the past few weeks. One argument I've heard is that sort of net zero watch and maybe some of the MPs involved with the net zero scrutiny group have been trying to open up a culture war on the topic of net zero, on the topic of climate change. I, I, I don't except that at all. I think actually rising costs of energy, um, the cost of hitting your home, and actually all sorts of things um, could be impacted by the drive to net zero. This isn't an easy thing that we're trying to achieve here. This is actually uh, the decarbonisation of every element of our lives. Um, and uh, it, it will have huge impl uh, implications. People are maybe not going to be able to afford to to drive or, or to go uh, fly abroad on, on on holiday or or 
people are talking about not eating meat in the future. So this goes to really every single element of our lives. And, and, and it's completely right that that is uh, questioned um, and the implications of net zero policies that are, are actually being proposed are really thought through. So I think it's very helpful that we now have a proper debate about that. Um, and I think some people have said, well, it's been in all the parties' manifestos, which is true. And yes, people voted on those manifestos. But I think it's clear to most people that the last election was about Brexit. And we haven't really had that big public conversation about what we want net zero to mean. And so my personal uh, viewpoint would be that actually there doesn't need to be a conflict between good energy policies that decarbonize and people from uh, who are questioning net zero because actually if we can get the cost of energy down we can decarbonize at the same time that is possible and I, I believe that's possible so there doesn't need to be a conflict there but I think there does need to be a real focus on affordability because it is the poorest people uh, who uh, will pay the price of any increases in the costs of, of, of energy and all, all the other goods that are dependent on that. So um, I think Harry, that's, I that's where Net Zero Watch is coming from. Okay. Uh, are you one of those people who questions Net Zero, to, to use your own phrase, and, and if so, does that mean you question the, 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 the scientific basis for policies aimed at decarbonisation? Well, I would accept the reality of man-made climate change and that it poses a serious threat. I think some of the um, exaggeration that has gone on is unhealthy. I think to view it in existential terms rather than a practical problem that can actually be dealt with, I think draws us away from the realms of what can be practically achieved towards uh, a sort of anti-growth agenda um, which actually puts people off practical decarbonisation measures. So I think actually we need to be clear-eyed about what climate change is actually uh, meaning. We've got to be clear-eyed about the science. I think a lot of uh, coverage of extreme weather, for example, portrays almost every type of extreme weather uh, as getting drastically worse when that's not actually what the scientific data is showing. But I think, again, we, we, can, we can have an argument here about, about the science, but it's not very constructive because actually we can have policies that reduce the cost of energy and decarbonize uh, if they're designed in the, the right way. And I think that, that's a free market way. We need different technologies competing. Um, and I think we have to recognize the extent to which storage capacity is still very underdeveloped. And actually all the storage facilities that we have in the UK at the moment could only power the country for uh, a very short length of time. So actually, at the moment, we do need fossil fuel backup for renewable power, and that renewable power needs to compete on the basis of firm power. There was a great review done by Dieter Helm, who did a cost of energy review for the government, uh, and he proposed equivalent firm power auctions, which would actually put the burden on renewable energy generators to <clears throat> back up their own power um, and then compete on a basis of equivalent firm power. And I think that that would be the kind of innovation that I would like to see. Uh, that would mean that actually there is a real economic incentive to provide not just low carbon power, but low carbon reliable power, because that's the only thing that's gonna deliver the kind of grid that we need that can manage these energy challenges like we've seen recently with the rising power of gas, we've seen some low wind spells. Uh, and so we've been incredibly reliant on gas for certain critical periods. So we've got to be seeing that reliability problem dealt with at the same time as the low carbon problem. And okay. once we can get both of them sorted, then I think uh, then we'll be winning. Harry, thank you very much. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're getting close to, in fact, I think we've slid past the point at which I'm supposed to invite everybody to uh, chat amongst themselves. But before we do that, um, I agree with you, by the way, that it would not be constructive to, to litigate the science. I think that's pretty settled. Um, but you, you called for more debate on the policies that, that were in manifestos. And I want to come to uh, Professor Rebecca Willis, if we can, Professor in Practice at Lan the Lancaster Environment Centre. Rebecca, you've written about the idea 
that democracies are failing voters on climate change. Are you and, and Harry Wilkinson, in fact, on the same, uh, in the same place on this, in, that, uh, in calling essentially for more democracy, not less, more debate, not less, on these policies? Uh, no, we're not on we're not um on the same page um what you're seeing with net zero watch and the global warming policy foundation which it emerged from is basically science denial um morphing into delay tactics we could debate that but i don't want to have that debate i want to um cut to the actual situation there's been this debate is is framed in the wrong way because we're talking about net zero being a cost and that is absolutely not the case it's not the case firstly because the costs of dealing with three or four degrees of warming are literally uncountable. <laughs> they are so severe. It's also not a cost, even if you don't look at the costs of dealing with the climate crisis, dealing with the, 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 the impacts of warming, because um, those levies, which are supposedly adding to bills, have actually taken away from bills. So uh, those of you who've been following this for a long time will remember the previous incarnation um, of, of when, when, when um, uh, uh, the, the government was asked to cut the green crap. It did. It uh, reduced uh, um, policies to support wind power. It reduced policies to uh, support insulating our homes. And as a result, £2.5 billion pounds has been added to bills. We would have saved that money. Um, we would have saved it because wind, it, wind power is cheaper than uh, gas generation now. We would have saved it because our houses would have been better insulated. So those levies are saving us money, not costing us money. In terms of the democracy question, what I would say, and you know, this is what I work in, work on day in, day out, the electorate is not the problem here. Um, there is actually, whichever way you look at the evidence, if you look at polling data, if you look at uh, qualitative studies, if you look at uh, deliberative work like the climate assembly that I was engaged in, where you take a representative sample of people and ask them how we should deal with climate change, the picture is this, that people are really, really concerned about climate change because they've seen the science, they've seen what David Attenborough says, they know that, you know, the world that they are um, leaving to their children and grandchildren is, you know, it risks being substantially worse than the one we're in now. They're really concerned about that. Very high levels, very consistent, even through the pandemic. Um, and they are really frustrated by the silence and the lack of action from government. And so you have this sort of standoff between um, the electorate and politicians where politicians are nervous because they get bashed by the press and bashed by net zero watch. And um, they don't want that, that they become politically risk averse. They don't want to set out a bold stall on climate change. And then you have the electorate who um, become more and more cynical that government can deal with this problem. And so what we need to do is turn it around so that we actually have a democracy which takes people seriously, which, um, you know, which, which accepts the fact that people are desperately worried about this issue and works with them to find ways of dealing with climate that work for people's lives and work for people's values and outlooks. And there are plenty of things that we can do that make our lives better. Um, heat pumps in well insulated houses actually make them nicer places to live. Um, you know, the health benefits of um, moving away, um, of, of increasing um, walking and cycling in public transport are very well documented. The jobs to be had in the green economy, I could go on. There's a really positive agenda to set out. Um, and all the research, and you know, this is what I work on day in, day out, all the research says that there is public support for that. That support is not um, unconditional, of course, and we need to talk to people um, about ways that we can tackle the climate crisis in ways that improve their lives. But if we frame it as, oh, climate action is a cost, <laughs> um, that's not only factually incorrect, it's, um, you know, electorally unpalatable. And that's why we've seen these manoeuvres being effective, at least within the Westminster bubble, if not in the, in the, in the wider, um, amongst wider voters and citizens. Rebecca, thank you very much. Okay.
And I'd like to come back to you, by the way, ab about the makeup of the Climate Assembly and, 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 and how you ensure that it's generally, genuinely representative of... Nico McDonald is being extremely challenging. Are any of our colleagues who don't want a referendum on net zero interested in what everyday people think about it? Um, uh, and uh, a lot of other interesting stuff. Um, Maggie Brown saying, and I'm going to have to uh, paraphrase because there's so much in the chat that I can't find the actual uh, 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 remark that I wanted to quote. Uh, Maggie Brown is saying, saw the, in capitals, flaws, and that is why there is a very significant backlash. Um, uh, we may come to you, and I'd, I'd like to come to Margaret Taylor, as I keep saying, but first, Phoebe, um, put her hand up. Phoebe, what's on your mind? Well, if you read SenseMaker, this isn't news. Um, but we've done a couple of little nibs on things like Australia. Um, and I think it was really interesting to see. So if people didn't know, the largest coal plant in Australia shut down. It was kind of unexpected. Um, that was the words from Angus Taylor, who's kind of the energy minister in Australia. And I know we kind of met, you mentioned it at the top, Giles. But you know, now there is no choice but to move forward and rapidly move forward on storage, on solar, on renewables. But the words from Angus Taylor were, it's going to cost more money. I can't believe the coal plant did this. Like, why would they shut down? And surely it just seems inevitable that it would shut down. You know, are we going to reach that point? Because at the moment, you know, they, that coal plant was about a third of the power for, for New South Wales. At some point in, by 2025, if they don't have the capacity, yes, there will be, you know, blackouts. There will be issues. So are we kind of head towards that, that point at any point in the UK? And do we need to prepare for it? We can be bored about it, but it's just been on my mind and thinking about it and the way that they reacted. Um, and it's, I think it's a similar argument that we're making here as well. But are you suggesting that economics is going to trump a sort of popular sentiment in, in the long run anyway? And it doesn't really matter whether we, the citizens, are bored of climate change or not? Well, surely, yes. Like, if that's the way that we're going in terms of thinking about you know, at some point, the, the issues that we're having, there's going to be market pressures that will move outside of. And, you know, th and that was what was interesting is, you know, Angus Taylor clearly should know all these things about what's happening in his country. Biggest coal plant shut down. He's like, what? why is this happening in the next five years rather than seven years? So, you know, if, if that demonstrates anything, it's, it, it's that economics will trump at some point politics. But I don't know if that's just, you know, an anecdotal example or whether or that is true for, you know, the UK, the US or beyond. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, Katie, in just a second, <laughs> hold the mic. I promised I'd come back to Rebecca uh, Willis. And uh, I, I, I just, while I have the thought in my head, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, how do you uh, assemble a climate assembly? And do you have within it uh, those people whom Nico described in the chat as, I, th I think it was everyday people, people, let me put it this way, who might have trouble uh, paying the green levy or object to it. Absolutely, yeah. So the Climate, Climate Assembly UK was commissioned by six select committees in Parliament. It was cross-party. Um, we and, and I, I was an expert lead, so I, I advised how the process should run. There were 108 people, um, normal citizens, selected by um, by lottery, essentially, but then um, picked so that they were representative of the UK as a whole in terms of um, socioeconomic status, gender, ethnicity, where they live in the country, and attitude to climate change. So we had people who disputed the climate, the science of climate change. Um, they're very few because they're very few in the population. I mean, you know, vanishingly small. But we also had people who we had, uh, you know, people who were on uh, very low incomes. We had um, people who uh, didn't agree with, uh, you know, some of the current government policies around climate. Of course, that's the whole point. And over the course of, um, well, equivalent to four weekends, some of it ended up in, in COVID times. Um, over the, 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 um, the course of four weekends, we asked those citizens to decide what the government should do on climate change, how that net zero target should be reached. And there was loads of discussion. Um, there was, you know, lots of disagreement, obviously. But the bottom line was everyone um, 
uh, everyone agreed on a you know really ambitious proactive and practical strategy for net zero which actually goes beyond what the government are doing at the moment and the you can see something like the climate assembly as a sort of a uh, miniature example of how our democracy should be working, where people have good information, they have access to expertise, um, they have um, the chance to debate and form their views, um, and also they're taken seriously and respected. And if you give people the time and the space to think these issues through, and if you give them access to the right evidence, very, very impartial and objective evidence, they come up with really sensible decisions. And that's what we found. I've been involved in, in lots of processes like that at the local level as well. And again, you know, same results. So we need to be, that. this is what I mean behind by more democracy, not less. We need to be um, allowing people to, uh, to be involved in those decisions um, and have that nuanced debate that you get through a deliberative approach like this, which a referendum doesn't give you because a referendum is, you know, yes, no, um, and it, and it and a referendum um, also, as we've seen to our cost, does not encourage, um, you know, sharing of good, um, of good information and evidence. So I would say absolutely we need more democracy, but we need it of the right sort and we need the kind of democracy that respects people and takes time to learn with them so that, you know, citizens can learn from politicians and vice versa. OK, uh, thank you, Rebecca, very much. And I should say that uh, before we broke for the two minutes, Mark Selby said, bravo, Rebecca Willis. Thanks for reframing. Um, Katie, sorry to... So I just was interested in who the we are. Is the we the consumer or is the we the media or is the we the politicians? Because I think Rebecca's point about actually consumers catching up now with actually this being something that actually the average man and woman on the street cares about, I think is true. We're in the, the thing that you would call in any major change program, the sticky middle, where it's like really, really hard now. <laughs> it's really hard now to make it a reality. You're laughing at me, but well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's this is the hard bit, right? This is the easy bit to give up in. So like the sticky middle of any change program is like where you, you say you want to achieve something that's a really big, as they call it in business books, big hairy goal. And everyone gets excited about that, saving the planet, getting to net zero, that's exciting. You get people to the place where they understand the burning platform, and then in the middle it's really difficult. And that's why we ask questions like, are we bored of climate change? No, we're not bored of climate change, we have to fix it. We don't have an alternative to do it. But this is where comms comes in. This is where actually incentivizing people to think differently about things comes in. And we know that this government is really bad at one thing, and it's comms. So I just say that actually... could say it's bad at other stuff too. I'm just going to go for comms. Okay. I'm just going to stick with the thing I understand, which is comms. But I would say that this is where it really matters. So you're in the, we understand why it's, you know, why it matters, right? But we're not making it work and we're not making it easy. So if you want people to stay with it, you need to make it work and you need to make it easy for people in their homes and in their lives to actually make a difference and understand it. And it's called the sticky middle for a reason. It's really hard, but that doesn't mean we should give up. And questions like this make it okay for some people to say it's all right to give up, and it's not okay to give up. We have to fix and, it. And just to be clear, uh, to your question, who, who are you thinking that we I is? Well, I think the media and politicians are more likely to get bored than the average man and woman on the street who now okay. understands it because it's not headline grabbing. And so unless we have a big hurricane or weather like we've just had, wherever it goes back into the news, but the hard yards are the hard yards. OK, thank you. I should have said this is Katie Vanek smith daughter's co-founder. Yes. Um, and just before we come to you, sir, I want to, Sam, to ask you. Uh, Katie said the government's responsibility is to make it work and make it easy. Uh, how are you doing that? So I agree with that, actually. I think... Obviously, as we've talked about, there is a lot of um, you know there is a lot of concern among the general public around climate action. Um, but I think that when you poll people about who they think should fix this challenge, they predominantly do say the government and business. Um, there's not a lot of desire for people to make individual changes to their own lives, and therefore I do think that 
the way the government should approach this is to try and make climate action as easy as possible for people, with a big focus on developing technologies that are cheaper, more convenient, um, and just generally better uh, for people's quality of life than the technologies they have at the moment. And I, I think that all the evidence so far is that that is happening. Wind and solar have fallen dramatically in cost of the cheapest forms of new energy generation. Running an electric car is cheaper than running a petrol and diesel car. I'm very confident that we'll see the same thing with heat pumps uh, now. And I think, you know, We've made those investments in wind and solar a decade or so ago, and that's why we still are paying the green levies, because that was the R&D uh, investment that we made in those new technologies ten, uh, 10 or so years ago. Now, when we're building new wind and solar farms, we don't have to subsidize them. Um, actually, they're helping to bring energy bills down because they're cheaper than the wholesale price. And I think we'll see the same in other technologies as well. So to give a specific example of something the government's doing on this, in the heat and building strategy, which was published last year, which you know set out how to approach the the challenge of heat decarbonisation, which is probably one of the stickiest challenges in, in net zero. Um, they created this uh, boiler upgrade scheme, um, which would give people a grant to buy a heat pump. Now, obviously, it's still quite an expensive technology because it's immature. We only sell a few tens of thousands of those each year. But the challenge the government set industry was if we you know, s support the early adopters, people probably with a bit more money initially, to buy a heat pump, um, you create scale in the market, you can innovate, and you can bring the cost down of that technology over time. And we've seen that work with wind and solar, and I think we'll see the same with heat, uh, heat pumps as well. Um, and there are energy companies that have come forward off the back of that commitment to say we're going to invest in heat pump installers, we're going to invest in, in our supply chain, and you know, they're confident they can bring the cost of that down. So I think that sort of technology-based approach is kind of where the government's going and supporting that early, early phase and getting that initial deployment going. Very briefly, because we're running out of time and uh, lots of people want to be heard, uh, Katie challenged the Tory government on comms. Mm. And uh, uh, Baroness McIntosh made the point that this is an unusual challenge involving big upfront investments. How do you deal with the comms problem on a, and never mind the nitty gritty of heat pumps, mm. uh, on, on the big messaging level, how do you, how do you explain to people that this is an, a, a unique uh, challenge that involves precisely that big upfront I investment in order to save the planet? Yeah, well, I think there are sort of three three elements to it. Um, one is I say briefly. Yeah, it right off the <laughs> one is very quickly that yeah, the cost of inaction uh, is much greater. So yes, there's an upfront yeah. cost to tackling it, but that's much smaller than inaction. Secondly, as Becky was saying, there are lots of other benefits. So we are uh, improving our air, we're uh, improving the green spaces, which we all enjoy, which is good for our health. Uh, you know, lots lots and, and and jobs as well. And then yeah, thirdly is is that the the, the economy piece and that actually our sort of future industrial strategy, our future economy is going to be built around these clean technologies. And here in the UK, we can get a head start on developing those and export them around the world and breathe life back into our industrial heartland. So yeah, that investment is getting us a head start in those industries of the future. Thanks a lot. You had your hand up, sir. Could you uh, tell us your name? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, my name is Ben. Um, I run something called Praseg, which is uh, an all-party parliamentary group um, of MPs interested in renewable energy, but climate policy more generally. Um, I think there's two quick points I wanted to make. One of them is that um, most backbench MPs really do spend most of their time listening to constituent concerns, and I don't think there would be the, the massive amount of interest in Parliament that, that there is across all parties if there wasn't massive concern from people in constituencies all over the UK on this issue. And indeed, it's, it's the single most kind of consensus-based issue. It's one that does blur party lines. People from all parties are concerned about this and want to work on it. Um, and I just wanted to come back on something that Harry, I think it's Harry, mentioned yeah. earlier on the, on the democracy point. Uh, he said something that, that I found quite concerning. He said that um, he accepts that the government was elected on, a, on, on an zero manifesto, um, but then said that doesn't really matter because it was all about Brexit. And if we're talking about democracy and what people are voting for, I find it quite concerning to, set, to, to kind of set us up in this position where essentially you're saying people politicians can say what they like what they like because actually it really wasn't about that it was about this and so you, you kind of find yourself in this place where you're telling people what they voted for or telling people they didn't know what they voted for which we've learned in the last years is a very very dangerous place to be and far more threatening to democracy than anything else has, uh, that's been said this evening i find that quite a concerning concerning thought no uh, thank you um and i did promise earlier to come to margaret taylor margaret did you want to um, say why you regard a uh, hello Margaret uh, referendum as utterly outrageous. Hello, I've, I'm 
kind of overwhelmed through all the stuff that's just gone forward from now. But I think, uh, as somebody's already said, that we're still reeling from the 2016 referendum and all, all the uh, fallout from that, which is on various levels been quite negative. I think a referendum is the government and indeed parliament shifting their responsibility onto people who don't have access to, presumably, to as much expert help as the government has. And I would have thought that MPs would be having um, lots of uh, committees on this particular thing on all the aspects pertaining to climate change and net zero, which people in their own lives don't have that uh, close access to. So to have a referendum is, is, is beyond outrageous. It's, it's, it's missing the point as well. It's just shelving the responsibility. Uh, thank you. I regret to say that the flag's gone up, but I do want to, if you promise to be, and I'm really sorry, uh, Matt, not to have given you more of a bite of the cherry, but I, I, I'd invite our, our, our four guest speakers very uh, briefly to um, accept the premise that there is a risk of boredom and tell us how, in a line, you would keep voters engaged uh, w with this issue. Can we come first to Anne McIntosh, um, if you're still with us, Baroness McIntosh? Yes, I'm here. Um, I, I think uh, be kind to rural people and realize that we can't cycle or walk to work, uh, that we do uh, produce livestock and put food on people's plates. And I still think it's wrong, Sam has confirmed that the infrastructure is being paid up front by the consumers. I think it's wrong. I think it should be, the owner should be on the industry to pay. And then we reimburse them through, through our bills. Did I hear you right? You say be kind to rural people. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Matt, how do you keep people engaged? Well, one of the issues is that it's seen as this sort of green thing that environmentalists are into when in actual fact it affects every single person again in this room's life and will do for the rest of your lives and so we need to start making uh you know media we need to start you know making entertainment we need to start engaging people in ways that they want to be engaged on this issue uh, in a meaningful way and and go through that sort of difficult you know we are going through a difficult stage and we will probably for the remainder of this decade before a lot of the costs start really paying off and uh, things will be much better sort of beyond that but um so during that time yeah i think comms is an incredibly important thing to focus on but making it you know it isn't a divisive issue but we've already sort of said it is massively cohesive so we need to sort of take that in a positive way and start making positive things about it having positive conversations and and sort of broadening it to every people's everyday lives and presumably jokes yeah well, make it funny if you want to keep it slightly upbeat. <laughs> Sam, how do you uh, keep voters on side? Uh, well, I'll be very, very brief. I think you need to keep uh, making that positive economic case for this, that it's going to help people with the cost of living, it's going to create jobs, create investment in their community, uh, and ultimately yeah, contribute to those things that are pressing to people right now in their everyday lives, not just 30 years in the future. Yeah, and we do have concrete promises of jobs building Offshore wind pylons in Tees Valley. Yes, um, I sound like a Tory spokesperson, don't I? Um, Professor Willis, finally, you have, have the last word. Um, how do you keep people engaged? Well, people aren't, people aren't bored. People are scared about climate change. And so, and, and, and they're not confident that government um, is, 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 is really facing up to that challenge. So how you, uh, how you keep people engaged and give them that confidence is to be really upfront about the scale of the climate challenge, but also incredibly uh, positive and practical about what you do about it. The jobs that it can bring, the improvement that it can make to people's lives in rural as well as urban areas. Um, and how we can actually um, build a better society through tackling climate change. That's not my words. This is the kind of thing that the Climate Assembly, this is the agenda that they came up with. If you give that power to people in a genuine way um, and, give, and give them that respect, don't just assume that they're empty vessels who need to be, uh, you know, filled with knowledge or brought on brought on board. If you actually take voters seriously, um, they will be part of the solution, definitely. 
thank you, Rebecca, very much. Uh, very, very briefly from me, um, you, uh, Matt, mentioned the idea of holding two thoughts at once. And at the beginning of this, I had a variation on that theme, which is I, I think, I feel that we all live in a sort of quantum state where insofar as we engage with this issue, we do so very with alarm and, 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 and concern and a desire to, to do the right thing and, and, and help. And then there's daily life. And, and that's quite often just a separate thing where we, we go for days at a time just sort of doing our jobs, getting kids to school, and, and then we suddenly realize, oh no, the two things at once. And uh, very difficult to, 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 to do them all. And I think that's why this question is an important question. It may, we may have got the wrong word with bored. And uh, uh, Rebecca said, people are not bored, they're scared. But I, I do think there's this perpetual challenge of keeping people engaged uh, if we're to get from net zero laws to net zero in practice. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, I'm just going to remind us of these closing words because I think they were all worth taking away with us. Be kind to rural people. One thing we are not here is rural, and I think it's easy to lose sight of, of uh, different sets of requirements. Um, remember that this is not just a green issue, it affects us all. There is a positive economic case for going out strong. And just uh, to repeat what uh, Rebecca just said, people are not uh, bored, they are scared. And as you, sir, said, um, uh, this is an issue that actually unites MPs, broadly speaking, and voters uh, more than it d divides them. Though I think we are going to be hearing more from the Net Zero Scrutiny Group. I don't think they're necessarily going anywhere. Um, Thank you very much all for joining us. And the final thing I should say is that as a thank you for coming, those in the room are going to be offered a free copy of Hot Mess. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.